Good morning, everyone. I'm John Reynolds. Um, I'm the Deputy Director of Otago University's Brain Health Research Centre um, at, here at the University of Otago, as well as the Chairman of the Neurological Foundation's Scientific Advisory Committee. I'm here to welcome you all to Brain Day very heartily on a lovely Dunedin day. And this is uh, part of the 2013 Brain Awareness Week New Zealand program. <clears throat> so today you're going to be treated to a series of talks throughout the day from scientists and from representatives of community groups supporting people living with neurological disorders and their families. Just while I think of it, those of you here who uh, would like to obtain some CME points, continuing medical education points if you're a professional, yes, um, please uh, go to the Brain Health Research Centre desk, just around and out to the right there, and ask for one of those forms, and you can have those completed for you. Thank you. So um, I'd like you to, to, today to take the opportunity between the talks to speak with the students and staff of our centre, and they're dressed in those beautiful bright green t-shirts that you'll see scattered amongst you, and to the community groups that are stationed at displays around the lecture theatre complex. I really encourage you to interact with the resources that we have. Please don't be afraid to get your hands dirty and touch some of the things that we have, the models, etc. Ask people lots of questions. Um, there are, on the wall directly outside there, as you go right around um, the, 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 uh, the hallway there, you can enter a room where there is a video, um, stay sharp video telling you things about keeping your brain healthy. There is also a room there where you can have your own brain waves recorded and take them home to show everybody, which is very nice, show you have a brain. Uh, and there is also this year something new, if, you if you've been before, a fluorescent microscope where you can actually see uh, living cells, or see cells that have been living that have been fixed in a certain state. You can see them fluorescing, and you can see also some amyloid plaques, which are uh, bits of pathology that are present in Alzheimer's disease. So please avail yourself of those opportunity. Now today's event is proudly sponsored by the Neurological Foundation of New Zealand. Last year the Neurological Foundation celebrated 40 years of funding neurological research in New Zealand. So if you do the maths, in 1972, back in its first year, the Foundation funded projects totalling $28,000. In 2012, the Foundation reached an astonishing annual contribution of $2 million in funding neurological research projects. Through this funding, the Foundation continues to make an impact on the progress of research into devastating disorders such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and Huntington's diseases, stroke, epilepsy, migraine, brain cancer, motor neuron disease, muscular dystrophy and many, many more. And these disorders are known to affect, um, affect New Zealanders, uh, one in five New Zealanders throughout their lifetime. So it's only been through the generosity of the Foundation's supporters and bequesters that the achievement has been possible. So on behalf of the Neurological Foundation and the Brain Health Research Centre, I'd like to acknowledge all the local supporters who made the Neurological Foundation Chair of Neurosurgery campaign a fantastic success in 2012. Our Chair, Professor Dirk de Ritter, has begun his work at Dunedin Hospital and at the University of Otago and is already forming strong research collaborations with scientists in our centre. So we are thrilled to present an insightful lineup of lectures and seminars that we're sure will leave you inspired and with a greater understanding of the incredible work carried out in laboratories and clinics in Dunedin and in other centres around the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Reynolds. I'm Roland White from the Neurological Foundation and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here today. Thank you so much for coming and bringing your brains with you. Uh, and it's also my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker of the day. But before doing that, uh, I would encourage you to register today. Some of you have actually pinched our registration pads off the table out there and are using them for notes. So at the conclusion of the lecture, would you kindly return our registration pads? And please make sure that you do register today. There are three good reasons for that. Firstly, it enables us to contact you and let you know about more exciting stuff coming up in the years ahead. But more importantly, we're having some prize draws later in the day. We have a wonderful coffee table uh, top book out there on famous New Zealanders, and they're autographed by Professor Richard Fall, and we're going to give three of those away today. Uh, and in addition, 
having the numbers and the registration enables us to go to the board and say there is support in Dunedin for these sorts of events and they will, provided we're able to prove the numbers, support us in doing more of this brain awareness. So it's very important that you register and please do that on my behalf, that would be lovely. Professor Smith, as it says up here, is a professor of neuropharmacology uh, at the School of Medical Sciences in this university. He has authored or co-authored over 240 scientific papers and he's on the editorial boards of several leading scientific journals. Professor Smith is also a valuable and a very valued member of our foundation's scientific advisory committee and he's been on that committee he tells me for over 10 years now and he does a wonderful voluntary job for us in approving and uh, 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 investigating the applications which come before us for funding. So he's uh, very well known to us and I'm going to introduce him to you now. I'm not going to tell you what he's going to talk about. That's his job. Please welcome Professor Smith. I'd like to thank the, the Neurological Foundation for inviting me to, to give this presentation and also uh, thank all of you for, for coming, uh, coming this morning. So I'd like to start by talking about what tinnitus is uh, because it can mean slightly different things. What I'll talk about this morning is subjective tinnitus, which is essentially a phantom auditory sensation, often described as a, a ringing in the ear, although the, the phantom sound that's perceived can be much more complex than that. Common causes of subjective tinnitus include noise trauma, loud noise exposure. It can occur as a result of ageing. Sometimes it happens as a result of head and neck trauma or even drug toxicity. There's also a condition called objective tinnitus, which is different and I'm not going to be talking about here. And this is a, a condition where the actual sound can be heard by somebody else. Um, and it, it's often due to uh, a pulse, pulsating um, blood vessel near the ear. But I'm talking today about subjective tinnitus. Um, we think that the, the basis of this condition is essentially a, uh, an abnormal pattern of activity in the brain. So it's a disorder of the brain. So why is it interesting? Well, first of all, um, as I'm sure uh, many of you in the audience know, it's an important neurological disorder that can cause uh, considerable debilitation and reduce quality of life. So it's interesting because we need to find a way of treating it effectively, and at the moment we don't have one. But it's also interesting from a fundamental neuroscience viewpoint because here we have a situation where there's, a, an, there's neuronal activity in the brain that um, is basically giving the impression of uh, a sensory stimulus in the environment that's not there. And so tinnitus is one of those conditions that gives us a window on how the brain essentially constructs sensory maps of the world. Um, and it shows us that the brain sometimes can't tell the difference between neuronal activity that represents a real sensory stimulus, normal sound, and neuronal activity that doesn't represent anything external. And in that way, it's probably related to quite a few other neurological disorders, for example, like neuropathic, uh, neuropathic pain. How common is it? Well, probably the best study we have at the moment is this study that was published in 2010, conducted in America. And in this study, they found in 2008, there were 50 million people in America suffering from tinnitus. 16 million of those experienced it frequently uh, during the previous year and it was estimated that the, the, the tinnitus uh, incidence increases with age, peaking at 14.3% between 60 and 69. So we can expect the incidence of tinnitus in New Zealand to, to uh, increase with age as well. The best evidence we have in New Zealand is a study published in 2008 by Welch and Dawes. This was part of the Dunedin multidisciplinary cohort that's been followed for decades. 
And they looked at 970 people born in Dunedin and interviewed at the age of 32, and they found that tinnitus was experienced at least half of the time by 7% of them, and then 38% experienced it less frequently. One of the interesting things about this study was that they looked at personality characteristics in tinnitus, and if you just look over here, one of the things they, they noted was that people who suffer from tinnitus tend to suffer from alienation and increased stress. And this is an extremely important uh, aspect of living with tinnitus. People who have tinnitus tend to be more stressed, they tend to suffer from anxiety and depression, and it may be the case that people who are more anxious actually experience worse tinnitus as well. One of the most common causes of tinnitus, of course, is, is noise exposure, um, including noise exposure in the workplace. And in this study from America, um, they found that 79% of workers exposed to noise, like industrial noise, suffered from tinnitus, um, compared to only 6% of workers who weren't exposed to noise. So obviously exposure to environmental noise is a major cause of tinnitus, subjective tinnitus. <coughs> More recently, it's become evident that um, a lot of people who uh, serve in the military suffer from tinnitus as well. And this particular study reported that almost 76% of veterans in America suffered from tinnitus, and just under 60% of them suffered from hearing loss as well. So it's now recognised um, in military organisations that, that uh, tinnitus is going to be a, a major problem for people returning from war. This um, figure shows different kinds of tinnitus that uh, are not related to any particular trauma, related to noise, <coughs> whiplash, head trauma, and other causes. And it shows the age and onset of tinnitus and the duration. And one of the interesting things here is if you look at noise trauma or exposure to loud noise, this tends to affect people who are younger in age, which is not surprising because um, people who listen to loud music using portable listening devices are likely to have a much higher risk of noise-induced tinnitus um, now and in the future. The other thing is that people who suffered from tinnitus as a result of noise trauma tend to experience it for longer periods of time. Also, there is some evidence that males suffer from tinnitus more commonly than females, and why that is isn't, uh, isn't clear at the moment. Tinnitus is often associated with hearing loss, but strangely and seemingly paradoxically, it can also be associated with a condition called hyperacusis. And hyperacusis means increased sensitivity to sound, or at least some sound. And as I mentioned, it's often associated with depression. So here, tinnitus um, can mean three things. One is you hear a sound that's not there, that can be very, um, very irritating and, and, and frustrating. Secondly, you have increased sensitivity to some kinds of sound. And thirdly, you also suffer from hearing loss in particular uh, frequency ranges. And here's an example of hearing loss. This is um, the hearing threshold in loudness along the y-axis against the frequency of sound in kilohertz. And these are the tinnitus patients in red. And you can see that above two kilohertz at higher frequencies, they show uh, a distinct hearing loss compared to, to control. So this, this is very common amongst people who suffer from tinnitus. Not everybody, but, but amongst a group of tinnitus sufferers. On the other hand, tinnitus can also be associated with hyperacusis or increased sensitivity to sound. So we're looking at sound level along the x-axis. And what this is showing is that amongst uh, tinnitus sufferers shown in the black squares compared to the control group, you can see what they experience as a loud sound is actually softer compared to the control group shown in the open, open squares. So, so you can have someone suffering from tinnitus who actually uh, has hearing loss within a certain frequency range but is also increasingly sensitive to some kinds of sound. So it's little surprise that this sort of condition, this complex auditory 
disorder can be related to the development of depression. Um, and here we have a, a recent study showing that in people suffering from tinnitus for various, from various causes, um, they score highly on the Beck dep depression inventory. So it's very well recognised that, that tinnitus and depression go together. And that's one reason why one of the classes of drugs that clinicians often try are, are the antidepressants. And I'll come back to that. <coughs> what causes tinnitus? Well, for subjective tinnitus, not objective tinnitus, for subjective tinnitus we know that the, the initial cause seems to be damage to the hair cells in the auditory part of the inner ear. This appears to be the trigger, but it's not the mechanism that maintains the tinnitus condition. The, the basis of the, the maintenance of tinnitus appears to be in the brain itself, so it's a central nervous system disorder in, in that sense. And one of the most pervasive hypotheses um, of tinnitus is that after the initial damage to the hair cells in the inner ear, you get a development of hyperactivity, abnormal activity, hyperactivity in auditory areas of the brain. So once sound is transmitted, um, sound information is transmitted from the cochlea in the inner ear um, through the eighth nerve, it goes to the brainstem cochlea uh, nucleus and then it's transmitted to uh, other places in the brain like the inferior colliculus and finally to the auditory cortex. And it's been found that at different levels of the auditory pathways in the brain there is this neuronal hyperactivity which you can think of as being somewhat uh, akin to um, hyperactivity or epileptiform activity in epilepsy. And indeed, Agi Mola suggested over 10 years ago that tinnitus is a form of sensory epilepsy in the sense that these particular auditory areas of the brain are hyperactive. What kind of evidence is there for that? Well, it's actually very good. This has been demonstrated in various ways in the human brain and in animal models, and I'm showing colour pictures here to make it a bit more obvious what's going on. This is a control cochlear nucleus uh, without tinnitus, and this is the cochlear nucleus in the case of tinnitus, where the hot colours indicate um, an increased level of electrical excitability in brain cells or neurons. And so what you can see that is that in the tinnitus cochlear nucleus, you have a lot more activity spontaneously and in response to sound. Uh, so uh, therefore we have a lot, of, a lot more hot colour in, the, in the, the tinnitus cochlear nucleus compared to the cochlear nucleus in the absence of tinnitus. So the cochlear nucleus is the first relay station for sound in the brain, existing in the brain stem. But this has also been shown in other parts of the brain, like the inferior colliculus. So here we have the inferior colliculi, this is in humans, uh, with tinnitus and without tinnitus. And once again, you can see the hot colours here represent increased activity, in this case, uh, in response to, to sound. So this increased response to sound may be part of the neural basis of hyperacusis, or that increased sensitivity to sound. Further upstream, even in the auditory cortex, which is shown here, um, there is evidence of hyperactivity, of increased response uh, under uh, basal conditions and also in respond to sa response to sound. So these yellow dots here indicate a hyperactivity in the auditory cortex. But it doesn't stop there. In fact, um, brain imaging studies show that abnormal activity exists in many other parts of the brain too, particularly in the limbic system. Um, for example, in the hippocampus uh, and in the amygdala. And there may be uh, an entire network of abnormal brain activity in, in people who suffer from tinnitus. And in fact, our new chair of neurosurgery, Professor Dirk de Ritter, who's here today, um, is an expert on, on brain imaging in, in the case of tinnitus. What about treatments? Well, there are quite a lot of treatments that are used, but um, it has to be said that, that not many of them are terribly effective at the moment, or at least there's no clear evidence that many of them are effective. One solution is to use uh, hearing aids and masking devices that essentially try to distract the patient away from the tinnitus. And some of these can be effective, in particular uh, individuals, depending on the, the type of tinnitus. 
Another option is a method called transcranial magnetic stimulation and also other kinds of direct current stimulation of the brain. And again, Professor de Ritter is an expert in this method and, and has led the, the world in, in the application of these methods um, in tinnitus patients. Cognitive behavioural therapy is effective in some people and there was a, a paper published in The Lancet last year um, supporting the idea that, that um, this could be effective in quite a few people. And then of course there's the option which is drug treatment, which is what I'm going to talk about and what our research concerns. <coughs> now, it would be easier to list the drugs that haven't been tried for tinnitus than to list the drugs that have been tried. Um, so this is actually a short list, believe it or not. Um, and it has to be said that, that the, the scientific basis for the use of some of them is actually extremely poor. Um, others have more of a, a rational basis to them. Um, sometimes if someone has tinnitus in connection with Meniere's disease, for example, which is a condition in which there's an overproduction of endolymphatic fluid in the inner ear, um, methods like injecting uh, gentamicin or steroids or even lidocaine into the uh, tympanic membrane may be used. Other things that have been used are IV lidocaine, vasodilators and osmotic regulators. There's not a lot of evidence that these things work very well, although there is a drug called misoprostol that has had some, some good results. Benzodiazepines have been used. Um, there's no really good evidence that these have any selective effect on tinnitus, although they may help some people. Of course, one of the problems with benzodiazepines like Valium is the, 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 the tendency for dependence to develop. <coughs> Anti-epileptic drugs seem like an obvious choice because, as I said, it seems like the neural basis of tinnitus, uh, in most cases, is neuronal hyperactivity in the auditory areas of the brain. So, Therefore, anti-epileptic drugs or anticonvulsants like carbamazepine, phenytoin, uh, valproate, uh, gabapentin and so forth um, have been used. Although, as I'll show you in a minute, if you look at the evidence overall, um, the case that they actually work is not very convincing. Antispasticity drugs like baclofen have been used and are used occasionally, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Antidepressants um, have been used to treat tinnitus, even though they are also used to treat the depression associated with tinnitus. And I'm afraid the evidence supporting their efficacy is not very good either. And lastly, there's a raft of herbal medicines, one of which is um, ginkgo biloba extracts, which have been promoted in some countries aggressively for the treatment, uh, for, uh, treatment of tinnitus. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. The problem is that tinnitus has different causes, even subjective tinnitus has quite a few different causes, and therefore the precise neural bases of these different kinds of tinnitus may not be the same, and therefore the different kinds of tinnitus may respond differently to different drug treatments. There's a real lack of good experimental studies of drug effects, uh, partly due to the difficulty in, in replicating tinnitus conditions in, in animal models. And also there are relatively few well-controlled clinical trials and so the drug treatment for tinnitus at the moment often amounts to trying this drug or that without any particular drug or category of drugs being um, specifically approved for, for um, drug treatment of tinnitus. So I picked out some, some reviews from, there's a, a review journal called the Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews, which is widely regarded in medical sciences as the, as the ultimate, um, the gold standard in, in analyses of entire literatures. And I, I want to show you three of these. This is a review published in 2011 on the use of anti-epileptics or anticonvulsants for tinnitus, which, as I said, would seem to be an obvious choice given the evidence for neuronal hyperactivity. And the conclusion was that there is no evidence from the studies performed so far to show that anticonvulsants have a large positive effect in the treatment of tinnitus, but a small effect of doubtful clinical significance has been demonstrated. So unfortunately overall, the evidence in favour of the use of anti-epileptics is not very convincing. And this is a review of clinical studies of the effects of these drugs in humans. 
This is a similar review in the same journal of antidepressants published last year. And the conclusion was there is as yet insufficient evidence to say that antidepressant drug therapy improves tinnitus. It may help the depression, but it won't necessarily help the tinnitus. Although you will find individual patients and even individual studies which actually show that antidepressants may help. Ginkgo biloba extracts. Uh, this is a similar review in the same journal. This has been updated from 2004 and the conclusion was there was no reliable evidence to address the question of whether ginkgo biloba is effective for tinnitus associated with cerebral insufficiency. Basically, um, if you've seen these ads in magazines like The Listener for Tebin and Fort, this is a particular ginkgo biloba extract called EGB761. There is no evidence whatsoever that these have any effect on tinnitus. Um, and I would suggest to you that they're a waste of your money. Um, the, these ads are carefully constructed to give the impression that they may be useful for, um, for tinnitus, with the reference to inner ear calm and quiet, um, which you're left to interpret uh, as you like. But there's no scientific evidence that these drugs work, um, either tested in clinical trials or in, in animal studies. So, that paints a fairly bleak picture of drug treatment for tinnitus. However, it isn't all bleak. The antispasticity drugs include a drug called baclofen, which is often used for spasticity in, in conditions like multiple sclerosis. And this is a drug that has been abandoned to some extent um, because of its adverse side effects. However, it may actually offer some, um, some hope um, in, in certain kinds of subjective tinnitus. We've shown in animal studies that L-baclofen reduces the expression of tinnitus. Um, unfortunately, there's only ever been one clinical trial of L-baclofen, or I should say, say of baclofen, one randomised placebo control clinical trial where it was shown to have no more effect than placebo. This was published in 1996 and has never been followed up. And also, just under a third of the patients withdrew due to adverse side effects like drowsiness and confusion and so forth. However, um, something that isn't often recognised is that this study combined two different forms of, of baclofen, L-baclofen and D-baclofen. And while L-baclofen has uh, one effect on a certain kind of receptor in the brain, D-baclofen has been shown to have the opposite effect. So by combining these two forms of baclofen in what is referred to as a racemic mixture, the people who ran the study may have effectively neutralised the effects of the L-baclofen. Um, they had no choice at the time because only the, the combination was available. So we have pursued L-baclofen, the active form of, of baclofen, in um, an animal model of chronic tinnitus and ha now have quite a lot of evidence that it, it may be useful. I should stress that we're not interested in L-baclofen itself um, because of its adverse side effects, but we're interested in L-baclofen-like drugs. So what we do is we, um, under anaesthesia, we expose animals like rats to a loud noise at a high frequency, and we produce a transient uh, hearing loss, which is shown here in terms of the threshold. This is a, an auditory brainstem evoked potential that we measure as a measure of transmission of sound information from the cochlea to the brain. And you can see in this group there's a, a large increase in threshold. So this confirms that there's a, a, a transient hearing loss. And then we use a, what is a fairly complicated animal model to try and basically um, attach the animal's perception of a high frequency tinnitus to another behaviour. And in this graph here, what we see is the animals that have been exposed to noise um, show a, a marked change in this behaviour compared to control animals or animals without tinnitus. And it's this separation of these two curves that for us is the, the behavioural hallmark of tinnitus in these animals. So this allows us or gives us some evidence that these animals are experiencing tinnitus and then what we can do is test drugs against that animal model and we can look at changes in brain activity, look at changes in biochemistry of the brain in order to try and um, see if we can develop new drugs. So in this condition here we're using the drug L-baclofen and these two curves 
coming together represents the disappearance of the tinnitus that's shown here. So this is some of our evidence that L-baclofen, at least as a, as a class of drug, might be useful in the treatment of certain kinds of tinnitus. Now L-baclofen is interesting because it acts on a particular receptor in the brain called the GABA-B receptor, and GABA is the most widespread inhibitory neurotransmitter in the human brain. So by acting on the GABA-B receptor as an activator or an agonist, L-baclofen may be turning up inhibition in the brain and therefore turning down neuronal hyperactivity that underlies tinnitus. Our interest is in activating the GABA-B receptor very selectively to try and help tinnitus without producing adverse side effects. And we can look at GABA-B receptors in the brain using things like immunohistochemistry where we have selective antibodies to those GABA-B receptors and this just shows the dorsal cochlear nucleus and some pictures of GABA-B receptor expression um, in the brain. And we have evidence that in the brains of animals that have tinnitus, there's a decrease in the expression of these GABA-B receptors. These GABA-B receptors that normally mediate inhibition in the brain compared to control animals. So these are different parts of the cochlear nucleus in the brainstem. And this decrease in the expression of GABA-B receptors that has occurred during the development of tinnitus may be part of the reason for the neuronal hyperactivity that causes tinnitus. So if you can increase the function of these GABA-B receptors by giving a drug that activates them, um, then that may be why uh, L-baclofen-like drugs might be useful. One of the things we've been investigating is, is whether these sorts of drugs might be more effective if they're given at a specific time. For example, um, if you were to give L-baclofen-like drugs within a critical period after noise trauma, maybe they could be more effective than if they're given later on. So we've been investigating that and we have some evidence that, that how effective these drugs are depends on when you give them in relation to the noise trauma. So all of our studies, I should have said, actually involve noise trauma rather than any other cause of tinnitus. Now our real interest is not in L-baclofen itself, but for the reason I, I, I gave about the adverse side effects. We're interested in the fact that L-baclofen um, has spawned a new class of drugs that don't have the adverse side effects of the original drug. And these are a large number of synthetic drugs like CGP7930. These drugs activate the GABA-B receptor um, very selectively and they don't produce the adverse side effects of L-baclofen. Uh, and in fact, um, this CGP7930 has also um, been suggested to have cognitive enhancing uh, properties. So there are a variety of reasons to be interested in it. Other drugs that we have tested or are currently tested, testing include cannabinoids. We have investigated cannabinoids and found no significant effect of those. There are some synthetic cannabinoids that you could use for this. We have tested anti-epileptic drugs like carbamazepine, at least in animals, and we actually have found um, significant effects from carbamazepine itself. We've looked at Chinese herbal medicines and we've found no effect. Um, we're interested in all possible treatment avenues. Um, um, the, the question is whether there's any evidence to support their, their efficacy. We have looked at memantine, which is a, one of the newer drugs that blocks a particular excitatory receptor called an NMDA receptor. This drug is actually available in New Zealand now, but it's, um, it's prescribed for Alzheimer's disease. We have looked at adenosine receptor agonists, um, and we're still analysing those results. And, most recently, we've started looking at uh, cyclooxygenase 1 or COX-1 inhibitors, which can have an effect uh, on inflammatory processes. So I want to turn now to the subject of inflammation and the, some of the evidence that we have that inflammatory cascades or processes in the brain might be partly involved in the development of tinnitus. It's possible to look at the, um, the, the, the generation of new cells in the brain by injecting a substance called uh, bromodeoxyuridine, 
which is incorporated into newly synth synthesised DNA. And one of our interests has been looking at cell turnover in the brain after exposure to noise trauma. So here we have tissue from uh, animals, uh, cochlear nucleus tissue, after animals have been exposed to noise trauma. And this is the cochlear nucleus at different times afterwards. And the BRDU in these, BRDU labelling in these uh, pictures shows up as these black spots. And an uh, amazing thing is that after an animal has been exposed to noise, and therefore probably um, in the human brain also, you get an increase in cell proliferation, even at this first relay station in the brain that processes information about sound. So there's an increase in the production of new cells. And if we quantify this over time, we find that by 72 hours, there is a significant increase in the number of new cells in the cochlear nucleus after noise trauma. And one of the surprising things is this, is, this happens in both cochlear nuclei, uh, both on the side of the noise, which is given on, to one ear only, and also on the opposite side. So in both cochlear nuclei, there, there's an increase in the number of, of cells, new cells being generated. When we start looking at markers for information um, in the brain, we find that um, a particular marker for activated microglia called CD11B shows a marked increase in expression by two days after the noise trauma, and it continues thereafter. So there's a massive microglial activation in this first relay station in the auditory system, the cochlear nucleus, which suggests inflammation, an inflammatory response. So we're thinking that this may be part of the switch that um, basically starts to create tinnitus um, and maintain it in the, in the human brain. And consistent with that, we find that cytokines like interleukin-6 show an increased expression starting at 48 hours after the noise trauma. We're continuing to look at this at the moment. We have a current Neurological Foundation grant to look at it. And what we're interested in is whether this inflammatory reaction can give us a clue to, to particular kinds of anti-inflammatory drugs that might be useful in stopping the inflammation and, and reversing it, and therefore stopping the progression to chronic tinnitus. So if inflammatory responses in the cochlear nucleus and further upstream in other parts of the brain are part of the cause of tinnitus, then maybe anti-inflammatory drugs uh, might help. So I want to finish by just acknowledging a few people. Um, I'd like to acknowledge in particular Dr. Yuan Zeng, who's a senior research fellow in our group. Um, I can't say enough about how important Yuan has been to the development of our tinnitus research. Um, she's pioneered uh, many of the methods that we use. Uh, also in our group, Associate Professor Cynthia Darlington, um, who's here today, as well as Philip Aitken, Shaza Begum, Lucy Stiles, and Shweta Vigal. And we have had a number of different organisations funding our research. Um, the Jean Cathy Estate has been very important to us, but I want to single out the New Zealand Neurological Foundation uh, because um, the New Zealand Neurological Foundation has really been responsible for, for a lot of the, the tinnitus research we've been able to do. And so we're very grateful uh, to them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Smith. Uh, so we have time now for some questions. Um, presumably they're not going to be all about GABA B receptors, are they? But we're quite happy to receive some of those, aren't we, Professor? Oh, yes. So um, can we have some questions, please? Anyone would like to ask the Professor? Here's a gentleman over here. There's a microphone coming your way. Greetings, sir. Um, um, just heard you speak about the, some of the side effects of carbamazepine. Could you tell me what they were? Um, carbamazepine is an anti-epileptic drug that um, can result in, um, in liver toxicity, um, potentially, and, and usually um, it's a drug that's monitored very carefully. It, it can lead to, to impairment of concentration, drowsiness, although people become tolerant to those adverse side effects. 
I think it can cause a, it can cause a, a decrease in white blood cell count that, um, that is often transient, but um, I mean, the best practice is, is to, to monitor um, white blood cell uh, levels after someone's started on carbamazepine. I have to say that, that, that my, my wife and collaborator, Cynthia Darlington, was on carbamazepine for the best part of a year, and, and um, I, in her particular case, it uh, was prescribed for trigeminal neuralgia because of the you know, commonality between neuropathic pain and, um, and other conditions like tinnitus. And, and in her case, um, she, ha she suffered uh, very much from the adverse side effects, I think particularly loss of, of concentration and drowsiness and so forth, although she had no problem with the other things. Thank you. Yes, up the back there, lady with the hand up. Um, you all hear the I, question? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to be charitable. Um, I guess, in my opinion, I think enough studies have been done. In fact, it, it, the only evidence that it has any effect at all are uh, from a, a number of studies published in, in Germany, in German journals, most of which haven't been very well controlled and don't have placebo controls. Every study that's actually looked at the effects of ginkgo biloba extracts with placebo controls where the, the experimenters don't know which subjects are getting the placebo and which are getting the ginkgo has shown no effect. Um, and there's no animal evidence to support it either. In, in fact, what I would say is that EGB761 actually does have some chemicals in it which can actually be um, helpful, can be neuroprotective under some circumstances. And in fact, we've done research where we found that. But the chemicals called terpenes in ginkgo biloba have to be used in such high concentrations that you'd never get those kinds of doses in a ginkgo biloba extract that you, that you take. So, and I think that's one reason why it doesn't have any, have any effect. So I think the evidence is, is conclusive. And, and um, I don't know anybody in the tinnitus world who actually speaks in favour of ginkgo biloba <coughs> extracts. Um, I'd, I'd be interested in asking Professor Derrida uh, uh, his opinion. Thank you. Another one? Yes, just gentleman in the front here. Um, why, would people, sir, uh, why would people who have spent years researching how to research not have placebo trials? Isn't it really <laughs> obvious? <laughs> well, you know, that's a really good question. I, I, personally, I can't see the point in running trials at all that don't have, if not placebo controls, at least a, a control condition which is the best conventional treatment because one alternative that's often used in clinical drug trials is you compare the new drug with the best existing treatment for ethical reasons. Th these trials um, that, that, um, that don't have placebo controls or aren't blind have in some cases been run, run by the companies that manufacture the, uh, the extracts. And they're published, but they're not very well respected. And so, you know, I agree with you. I mean, I don't think there's any point at all. The only, in, in clinical trials in New Zealand, the only case where placebo controls are not used or, or, or some uh, conventional medication control isn't used is usually in phase one trials where um, they're looking for safety um, of, uh, of a new drug. Thank you. Another one? Lady up here. My mother has tinnitus and it's in her right ear and she's had it for so long that she says she almost doesn't hear it anymore because it's a constant persistent thing. And I have had tinnitus in my right ear that sort of comes and goes and I don't know what affects it. So my question today is, is tinnitus hereditary? I don't... Uh, I, there is some evidence that there may be a, um, a genetic basis to it, but I think most tinnitus, as far as I know, um, most tinnitus, uh, tinnitus isn't. Um, so I can't explain the coincidence of you having it and, and, uh, and your mother having it. Um, I mean, it may be that there's been some... Um, an, another explanation for that is you could both have been exposed to the, to the same thing, as unlikely as that might seem. Um, 
But you know, many people experience tinnitus at some time in their life, even if they wouldn't consider themselves a tinnitus sufferer, they, they suffer transient tinnitus. Um, and the other thing is what you described as, as, um, as um, a shifting of att attention away from, from tinnitus is something that, that people have tried to investigate scientifically. There's a, a group in France that actually gave people who suffer from tinnitus another tone in auditory space and got them to try and focus on that and they found that the more they focused on it the, the, the less they seemed to perceive the, the tinnitus which was located at another point in space and then eventually even after they, they got rid of the, the new sound the tinnitus experience at least for a while seemed to be reduced. Could I just say one more thing? So does that mean um is there any link for people having transient tinnitus for it to get worse, you know, if it's... I mean, I experience it periodically. It, is it likely it will become, like my mother's, like, constant? I can't say I can answer that question, I'm afraid. I, I'm actually not a clinician, so I'm a researcher, so I don't know. I don't, I don't think there's any particular reason to expect that it would, it would get worse. But it's something you would need to see a... a um, either an audiologist or a, an ENT surgeon about, referred from a GP. Thank you. Oh, lots of questions. That's fantastic. Um, can you make do without a microphone up there? Speak up, please. Lady on the left. Thank you. Can you tell me at what stage the magnetic um, pulsing or stimulation is happening? Is that <laughs> the stage? Well, we, we, we actually have an expert uh, on that subject in the, in, in the audience, so I can only give my opinion on that. Um, I think that there encu there's encouraging evidence um, that, um, the, the, that and also related methods involving brain stimulation may work. But, um, and there are studies that have been published, uh, one in the journal Neurology last year, showing that it had no more effect than, than placebo. But there are many studies that have shown that it can have a beneficial effect. I think the stage, my take on it would be the stage is that we don't know exactly, we don't know how, how it works, and in fact, um, in collaboration with Professor Derrida, we're planning to do studies to, to try and find that out. In fact, in collaboration with um, Professor Reynolds as well. So we don't know how it works, so it's very hard to, to, to use it in a way that will have a selective effect. And so that's, I think, in the future, with, with that method and other related methods, once we learn more about exactly how it works, on abnormal brain activity and tinnitus, it'll be possible to basically sharpen its, its use. Um, so I think it's very encouraging. And of course, um, uh, at least so far, it appears, not to be, um, it appears not to be associated with the kind of adverse side effects of, of many drug uh, therapies. Thank you. Well, there are lots of questions. Excellent. Lady in the red. I'll come back to you. Perhaps you could repeat that question. Uh, is there any association between um, autoimmune disease and tinnitus? And, and the use of anti-inflammatory drug or... And, and the, the anti-inflammatory anti condition or is, yeah, um, autoimmune disease and the long-term prognosis of tinnitus. That's a really sort of terrible thing. Right. So you're thinking that... that um, you're thinking, for example, that um, tinnitus associated with multiple sclerosis may be, um, may have particular characteristics. I, I don't, I don't know of any direct connection between autoimmune disease and and uh, and and the development of tinnitus. Um, although people with multiple sclerosis often suffer from um, a variety of sensory uh, abnormalities. Thank you. This lady here has been desperate. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I just want, you, did, you focused mainly on the drug treatment. Mm. Um, what about the hearing aids and the masking devices? Um, is there, there obviously a direct link between hearing loss and tinnitus? It's possible to have tinnitus without hearing loss. It, that's what I yeah, so It's many, possible many, to have tinnitus yeah, without yeah, hearing loss. I have, I have a profound um, hearing loss. I am quite deaf. I have a cochlear implant. Oh, right, right. No, hear, no tinnitus whatsoever when I'm switched on. When I have sound, when I switch off, right. tinnitus. Yes. 
The, the one thing that's very important in tinnitus, of course, is attention, and, and this also connects with emotion, which again is something that Professor Derrida has studied quite a lot. If the brain imaging studies indicate that if you look beyond the obvious areas of the brain that process sound, which you might expect to change in tinnitus, like the auditory cortex and the inferior colliculus, in fact, there are abnormalities um, throughout the, the limbic system and other parts of the cortex that. And, and I think Professor De Ritter has coined the, the phrase a distress network, as if because someone is experiencing tinnitus, uh, many different parts of the brain involved in attention and emotion start to change. So you can find people who suffer from tinnitus who are not very bothered by it, and um, it's almost as if they're, pers if you like, their personality type, for the, for, for the want of a better way of describing it, um, means that they can cope with it better and, and they may even experience less tinnitus as a result or, or, or less severe tinnitus. And then other people who are very, very disturbed by it and their tinnitus gets worse and worse, partly perhaps because of their anxiety. And I mean, those people are likely to have changes in emotional areas of the brain that, that change the way they attend to stimuli. So that means, that's a, I, I guess that's a complicated way of saying that if somebody's focusing on their tinnitus, um, it may get much worse than, than if they can find a way of distracting themselves. And one way of doing that is with, with other sound. And so a hearing aid can improve people's perception of non tinnitus sound, so that can help. And also masking devices can basically shift people's attention. So it's a, it, it's a very important kind of therapy, although the, the actual brain basis of what's happening isn't, isn't really well understood. Okay, I think we can take one more. This gentleman here is Yes, sir. Loudly, please. The um, two parts of what I've found in reading is uh, the is uh, green laser use and also white noise. Um, what are your comments on those two ideas? Sorry, I missed the first one. Green laser therapy. Oh, green laser therapy. Um, I, to be honest with you, I don't. I've never heard of green laser therapy. Um, what, what is it used for? Um, So it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of surgical manipulation? Correct. Oh, okay, right, okay. Um, well, d depending on the cause of the tinnitus, um, then those sorts of approaches can be very effective. For example, if somebody has tinnitus which is a result of a distinct inner ear abnormality, uh, I mentioned Meniere's disease, then um, uh, various kinds of, uh, of, of approaches to the, to the ear can be very effective and, and that's why people often use intratympanic injections of, of, um, of some of these drugs like gentamicin. Um, I, I don't know anything about that to be honest with you. I mean the kind of tinnitus I'm talking about is often initiated through hair cell damage caused by noise. So the hair cells are damaged although they're not destroyed and then the abnormal activity really develops in the brain. With the white noise, that's a kind of masking tactic where by giving the person um, a sort of blanket noise, um, it can shift their attention away from the irritating tinnitus um, uh, stimulus that, 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 that actually isn't there. And it, I mean, that, that brings us into the very complex world of, of the psychology of, of sound perception and, and what it means. And I think one of the interesting things about tinnitus is that um, it's a neurological disorder, but um, when people have a neurological disorder that involves, in this case, hyperactivity of auditory areas, it changes other brain areas as well, like emotional areas, obviously, because it, it's frustrating and debilitating. It changes the way people attend to, um, to sound, changes their behaviour, which then feeds back on the original condition, often to exacerbate it. So, in the end, it's it's... It's a neurological disorder that, that actually uh, involves many, many areas of the brain and many aspects of, uh, of personality. I mean, people still don't understand yet why a masking device, at, a, at the level of brain activity, why it, it works exactly. I think that's a lovely way to end uh, the presentation today, and I'd like you all to show your appreciation to Professor. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.
Thank you so much, everyone. Professor Smith will be here for a while. I think, uh, Paul, you'll be outside for a wee while. If you may like to collar him before he takes off. There are plenty of other interesting things uh, going on here today. The cafe is open if you're hungry. There's a video showing on staying sharp, all about brain health. So I'd encourage you to do that or get your brain waves tested. Uh, our next seminar is on Alzheimer's and caring for the carer, and that'll be at 11.15 here. So you could wait for that if you wish, or you could come back for that. That would be great. Please register if you haven't done so. I plead with you to do that. Thank you. <laughs>